Well, welcome everyone and thank you for joining our webinar today with Bob Fries, Professor Emeritus at Cal State Long Beach and author of Epidemiology 101. Dr. Fries is going to be exploring some ways to make epidemiology a fun and engaging course for your undergrads. My name is Sophie Teague and I'm the Senior Marketing Manager for Public Health and Health Administration here at Jones and Bartlett Learning. So at this point, I'd like to go ahead and introduce you to our featured presenter, Bob Fries. Bob Fries is Professor and Chair Emeritus at the Department of Health Science at Cal State University, Long Beach. He's also the former director of the Cal State Veterans Affair Medical Center, Long Beach Joint Studies Institute, and the past president of the Southern California Public Health Association and member of the Governing Council. He serves or has served on the advisory boards of several health-related organizations, including the California Health Interview Survey. He previously retired from the University of California, Irvine, where he was an associate clinical professor in the Department of Medicine, Department of Neurology, and School of Social Ecology. Dr. Fries has had a varied career in epidemiology as a health department epidemiologist. He led investigations into environmental health problems such as chemical spills and air pollution. He's taught courses on epidemiology, environmental health, and statistics at universities in New York City and Southern California. And the topics of his research publications and presentations include tobacco use, mental health, chronic disease, disability, minority health, and psychosocial epidemiology. He's the author of four books from Jones and Bartlett Learning, Epidemiology 101, second edition just published this month, also Essentials of Environmental Health, both Epi 101 and Essentials of Environmental Health are part of the Essential Public Health Series. He's the author of Epidemiology for Public Health Practice with uh, Thomas A. Sellers for editions one through five. And then he is the author of Occupational Health and Safety for the 21st Century. So with that, I will now hand things over to our presenter, Bob Fries. Hi, this is Bob. I wanted to thank Sophie for providing this opportunity and I'd like to welcome my friends and colleagues who are participating in this webinar. Um, the way I'm thinking of this webinar is that I would like it to be a forum for discussing how to make epidemiology interesting for undergraduates. Let's talk for a minute about the challenges to teachers of epidemiology. It's um, an area that I've been working in for several decades. Um, what's interesting about epidemiology is that it's often a required prerequisite course for non-majors who may not necessarily be focused on the subject matter. For example, students often come from fields like healthcare administration, nursing, and other health science disciplines. And epidemiology students, at least my students, tend to be highly diverse meaning that they have limited public health experience, limited medical background, and limited quantitative backgrounds. So what can we do as instructors to overcome challenges? Um, first of all, I want to point out that um, epidemiology is intrinsically a fascinating field. Um, consequently, epidemiology captures the involvement of students who come from many backgrounds. Uh, what I do when I'm starting out in um, week one, the first lecture, I try to use icebreaker questions that do not require specialized knowledge. Why is epidemiology interesting? Well, first of all, we hear about epidemiology all the time in uh, the popular media, in the newspapers or online. Also, epidemiology can be approached as a low technology field that can be appreciated by practically everyone. It can also be considered a liberal arts discipline that can be addressed through the study of historical epidemiologic literature. And then it reinforces certain important habits of mind, such as problem analysis, deductive and inductive reasoning, and making generalizations to a broader context. So I'd like to share with you today 
three key principles for making epidemiology fun for undergraduates. So the first one is encouraging student engagement. The second one is use current examples. And then the third one is to employ alternative modes of instruction, for example, self-paced learning. So the website for my book, for example, has available flashcards, and there are also web-based activities from the book's website. So how can we encourage student engagement during the first meeting of class? What I like to do is ask them the question, What's special about epidemiology, and what do you hope to gain from this course? So what kinds of responses do I often get when I ask, what's special about epidemiology? Well, this is an excellent icebreaker. So students will often mention an infectious disease outbreak that they heard about, like perhaps um, an outbreak of foodborne illness. However, what should the instructor emphasize in response to the question. Well, um, as an instructor, you should make sure that uh, the student aware is, is aware of the fact that epidemiology focuses on the population. And secondly, that it does not focus exclusively on infectious diseases, but a variety of different kinds of health outcomes. And then thirdly is the concept of what is meant by an epidemic. Um, some of the kinds of responses when I ask the question, what do you hope to gain from this course? Um, so then the students will give various answers, and what I try to do is come back to the idea that epidemiology is a basic science of the whole field of public health, and it imparts a whole range of skills that um, the student could be could use in their current education, future education, or employment settings. So then um, I often like to start with an infectious disease outbreak as an icebreaker, and I might ask them to talk about an infectious disease outbreak. And one that came up um, in 2014 was the Ebola virus outbreak. And this particular outbreak accounted for more than 28,000 cases, and it was the largest Ebola outbreak in history. Then I like to transition over to the idea of the greater issue of epidemic disease and stress the idea that epidemics are not limited to infectious disease outbreaks. So example. Um, mass shooting in U.S. schools. So we're aware of various incidents that have happened in universities and elementary and secondary schools, um, various colleges across the United States, and then the Sandy Hook incident in uh, Connecticut. So those are some examples. Um, also, Students tend to be fascinated with historical development. So some of the ones that I mentioned to students um, have to do with Jenner's development of the smallpox vaccination, um, the work of John Snow, and then historical trends in infectious disease mortality. So for example, in figure 1-8, um, this particular cartoon expresses the idea that people were afraid of smallpox vaccinations because they thought that somehow they would become part cow. John Snow is very central to the study of epidemiology and his um, investigation of a cholera outbreak in London that occurred during the, 19, the 1850s. He is known as the father. He became known as the father of epidemiology. And I like to emphasize to students that the methods that he developed during this outbreak are relevant today. Um, and also, it's important to reinforce the idea of natural experiments and the natural experiment as being emblematic of the epidemiologic approach. And I like to ask students to try to identify natural experiments that are occurring 
um, nowadays or recent natural experiments they might have heard about. Another um, ice-breaking question is to talk about some of the practical uses of epidemiology. I like to ask students and uh, share with them how it is used as a practical field. Um, an example is the historical use of epidemiology to track changes in mortality over time. So as figure 114 shows, there has been an increase uh, there was an increase in influ influenza mortality um, early in uh, the 20th century, but then over time there has been a declining trend. So, all right, now you have their attention for sure. So then what are some remaining crucial topics that you need to discuss? Well, these include epidemiologic measures, the importance of data, descriptive epidemiology, um, so versus analytic epidemiology, causal inference, epidemiologic study designs, the policy arena, screening for disease, and then some other applications that you might want to mention, for example, infectious diseases, social epidemiology, and special applications. So let's turn to epidemiologic measures. And I think it is important to emphasize four major areas here. One has to do with the distinction of samples versus populations, measures such as prevalence, mortality, and crude rates and the purpose of rate adjustment. So let's take a look at prevalence. So here's an example of prevalence for asthma. Asthma is a very prevalent condition, which states tend to have higher prevalence than other states in the United States. Then with regard to mortality, an interesting measure is proportional mortality measures. When we compare the 10 major causes of death in the United States, um, it's obvious that diseases of the heart are the leading cause of mortality. They have the highest proportional mortality ratio, followed by cancer. Um, then it's interesting to compare crude and adjusted death rates. So the population of the United States is aging, and um, we would expect that the crude death rate would tend to increase or remain, at least remain stable. Um, here in this sh slide, it's declining slightly. However, when we look at the age-adjusted death rate, we can see that it has declined over time since 1960. All right, another concern is how can we interest undergraduates in epidemiologic data? So I like to ask the question, why do you think data are important for epidemiology? And also, how might you use epidemiologic data in your job? So the example of big data comes up. And that is related to many people's experiences, for example, interactions on social media, applying for a credit card, applying for health insurance. And then also related to the topic of data, how are other sources used, for example, the National Health Interview Survey and uh, data from the World Health Organization. So let's turn to figure 4.1, and we can see the three defining features of big data, volume, velocity, variety. So I like to talk about the implications of big data for the future of epidemiology. And then also, I like to discuss various extant data sources that are available. For example, the National Health Interview Survey, when did it begin and what types of data are collected. And then some people are interested in exploring international health 
issues. So um, I point out the work of the World Health Organization and give them the website for the World Health Organization. So then we come to a really interesting and fascinating topic for undergraduates, and that is descriptive epidemiology. So I like to begin with case reports as one of the most elementary forms of descriptive epidemiology. And I have the example of bison encounters in Yellowstone Park and what happened to people who were injured by bison. Um, there's also an example of a rabid dog that was imported from Egypt. So these are interesting case studies. Then I move on to the topic of cross-sectional studies. How do we define a cross-sectional study? What's involved? What are some examples and so forth? And then finally, by looking at descriptive variables, it is possible to broach the topic of health disparities. So I'm trying to use examples that are compelling to undergraduates. Um, some examples are teen birth rates, sex differences in incidence of mortality from cancer, difficulties in physical functioning. Let's take a look at the birth rates for females aged 15 to 19. And you can see the trends over time comparing the different age groups in birth rates. Then when we turn to the next figure 5-7, we can compare incidents, new cases of cancer versus mortality from cancer, and then look at incidence, so for males, prostate cancer, females, breast cancer. And then when we look at mortality, deaths, uh, many students are surprised to find that um, females, or among females, the leading cause of death is lung and bronchus cancer. Similarly, um, how do different ethnic and racial groups compare with respect to difficulties in physical functioning? So then um, students have been thinking about Ebola virus. They've been talking about um, cholera in London. So the next question that comes up has to do with using epidemiology to demonstrate causality of diseases. So let's consider disease causality and history, and then some of the types of causality, for example, deterministic and probabilistic causality. Um, I don't really discuss this further here, but polio and spongy tar, which was an example of a non-causal association. And then um, there is also, well, an exhibit in my textbook about applying Hill's criteria of causality to the uh, relationship between infection with the Zika virus and microcephaly. So let's look at figure 6-2, and we can see um, an old-time cartoon that shows some um, disease-causing organisms in a drop of water. Uh, this is attention getting, and it's also noteworthy because it represents a movement away from the miasmic theory of disease causation. Uh, then um, it's interesting to talk about deterministic versus stochastic causality. So when we examine deterministic causality, this has to do with the doc doctrine of necessary and sufficient causes. And then if we find an association between uh, exposure and outcome, what types of relationships are possible? So are they independent? Um, if they are not independent, then are they non-causal or causal? And is there an indirect association or a direct association? So then the next um, topic that follows from that uh, logically is how uh, discussion of causal inference relates to various study designs to support causal inference. So what you can do as an instructor is provide a map of the different types of descriptive and analytic designs, show them as a map. 
and then discuss some of the types of designs that are available. So among um, the types of epidemiologic studies, those fall into the two branches of descriptive observational studies and analytic studies. Then if you look at figure 7-3, you can see an example of a case control study and what is involved in constructing a case control study. Now another fascinating area for students is the policy arena. And this is definitely a topic that engages beginning epidemiology students. And I think that it's an area that needs to be given attention in epidemiology. I like to discuss the 10 essential public health services and how that relates to policy. Also policy in the context of Healthy People 2020, um, examples of public health policies and laws, the national prevention strategy, health in all policies, the policy cycle, and ethics in epidemiology. I'll talk about the last two points. So here's the policy cycle, the phases involved in development of policy, and then I try to point out how epidemiologists are involved with the policy cycle. And then the issue of ethics in epidemiologic research, that's a very important topic for policy. An example is the Tuskegee syphilis study. All right, then um, screening for disease. So this is also a very important and interesting application of epidemiology. I try to give many practical examples. So who's affected by diseases and conditions that can be screened? And then what are examples of the terminology of screening, a false positive or a false negative test? So um, let's take the example of the BRCA1 gene. And um, as we may know from the media, Angelina Jolie was a carrier of the BRCA1 gene. So what um, were some implications for um, Ms. Jolie in terms of uh, what she did as a result of learning that she was positive for this gene? Also, the term false positive test and false negative test um, can be confusing. So I think that idea is captured in uh, this particular figure 9-12. Now, some issues regarding infectious diseases. I see we're coming close to the end of uh, my time period here. Um, I like to stress that Infectious diseases remain important causes of mortality for the world's population and for the United States as well. And then also um, share with students about the epidemiologic triangle and the concept of how vaccines prevent, protect us from infectious diseases. And then um, the issue of the role of social and behavioral factors in health. This is an increasing concern for epidemiologic research. Um, does stress have a relationship with our health? Um, E-cigarette use, non-medical use of psychotherapeutic drugs, prescription opioid overdoses, alcohol consumption, obesity. Um, let's take the example of e-cigarette use and how that has impacted high school students and the use has increased by nearly 800%. And then other forms of tobacco use, such as hookah use, has increased in recent years. All right, so now that came to the end of my session here of my presentation, and I'd like to turn the presentation back to Sophie. Fantastic. Thank you, Bob. 
Um, so at this point, we're going to move into the Q&A section of uh, the webinar. And um, I'll just remind everyone, if you'd like to ask a question, we very much encourage you to ask your question out loud. And you can also type your question um, using the Q&A box or chat box on the right-hand side of your screen. Um, and I will read your question out loud. And I do have one question uh, right away, Bob, for you regarding the new um, second edition of your book. Um, did you add any new chapters to the new edition? Yes, I did. Um, there is a new chapter on data presentation, and then that has a component for preparing for the MCAT exam. There are some practice questions and drill for the MCAT. And then I added um, a new chapter on screening. So there are two new chapters. And then uh, with respect to epidemiologic measures, those were distributed across two chapters, so I consolidated those into a single chapter, and then I added several additional measures that I thought were important. Great, thank you. Um, we have a question coming through here on the Q&A. Um, how would you approach teaching epidemiology online to undergraduates? Well, um, I, I'm not an expert, first of all, on online education, but what um, I have worked with um, online education a little bit, and I find that um, one way to do it, first of all, there's often a video or audio presentation of the content material, and then instructors use um, chat boxes, they create blogs and other ways that students can interact with one another online. Uh, that's kind of a brief answer, but um, it, it certainly is a, a growing area of interest that is teaching online. Great, thank you, Bob. So let's see, a few more questions coming through here on the um, chat box, um, are there any interactive games that you can recommend for a class? Well, actually, I've had students um, invent their own games, and then I believe we have on the website there's um, crossword puzzle games, but in my class, uh, students have invented um, Jeopardy using epidemiologic topics, and that seems to go over very well. Um, they really seem to enjoy doing that, and I know there are other, yes, many other interactive games. I was reading about something um, about a game that is available um, that I saw um, in a, a review of that, um, kind of like Monopoly, but it has to do with epidemiology. Great, thank you, Bob. Um, we do have some more questions coming through here in the Q&A. Someone is asking, uh, what are the expected skill sets that students should have prior to taking your epidemiology course? Do they need an intro to statistics course? Well, I recommend that um, for epidemiology, but I think that um, really any uh, sharp student, or they're all sharp nowadays, uh, anyone, any of them could take the course without prior training. Now, there's enough background provided within the textbook itself and reinforcement so that um, the, this particular textbook could be used uh, with um, students who have very limited background when they come into the course. Great, thank you, Bob. Um, here's a question, um, someone asking if the PowerPoint slides are available and the case studies you referred to in the presentation. Um, my guess is that she is referring to uh, lecture slides available with the book as well as the case study. Yeah, and those should be available. Yes, and they are definitely available. There's, and I'll just add, there is a complete package of instructor resources available. And if they want to take a look at the materials that come with the book, you can request those uh, instructor materials, instructor access on the website at go.jblearning.com slash freeze101. They are available there. Sophie, excuse me yep. for interrupting you, but 
The right. case studies that I mentioned in um, my webinar today, those are in the textbook. So, for example, bison encounters and the rabid dog. And then there are many other case studies or examples that are interspersed uh, throughout the textbook. So I just wanted to mention that. Great. Thank you for clarifying that. Okay, let's see, before I go to the next question here in the Q&A, Tasha, do we have any questions on the line? Your first question comes from Preachy Zinwar. Hi, I thank you for the opportunity to ask a question. Uh, we're currently using the public health practice textbook uh, in our graduate course for non-epi majors. It's a 100% online course, and I was wanting to get your uh, feedback on uh, how should we go about designing an exam on the Blackboard or online so that it is um, both comprehensive in terms of the materials or, or the content uh, that we expect students to master, uh, but at the same time, um, it is not standardized in terms of using multiple choice or true and false questions, um, and whether we should keep it timed uh, or we should have a week available for them to do it. And that's something that I've been quite struggling and any, any feedback and advice would be quite appreciated. Well, all right, so are you saying that uh, you prefer to have essay type questions rather than multiple choice that I understand? Um, and yeah, I wanted to get your feedback on that, which might be more thought-provoking, kind of deepen their um, understanding and application of the concepts and the materials. Um, mm -hmm. I've been using some of the test ban questions for homework and um, quizzes, uh, but then and when it comes to exams, um, do we stick to the same things or should we have them write responses, what have you done in your classes? Well, it, I think it depends on your audience. So if you're working with graduate students, they prefer essay questions. They like to deal with essay questions. If you're working with undergraduates, mm -hmm. often it's a little more challenging to use essay questions with that group. Or anyway, that's what I found in my experience. Um, and then at the end of every chapter, well, you mentioned public health practice. I have questions, study questions and exercises, but also in FP 101. Mm -hmm. And I think those could be adapted um, to an exam in an online course. Mm -hmm. And then they already have an idea about, they want to know what is the domain of information that they're responsible for. Mm -hmm. And by checking out the study questions and exercises, in advance, they can have an idea of what um, the expectations are, and then those questions could be modified uh, to make them appropriate for an exam setting. That's great. And any feedback on making it timed versus um, open book uh, or giving them a week to do it because it's online? Well, you know, if you, you are the instructor, so if you have it, not timed, then you're going to receive a voluminous response. Mm -hmm. And it may not be necessary to have such a lengthy response. So my own preference, what I would do for myself, I would make it a timed exam mm -hmm. because you get a more um, delimited response. Mm -hmm. It's a little more manageable to grade. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great feedback. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Bob. Uh, Tasha, are there any other questions on the line? Your next question comes from Jamie Myers. Hi. Um, I was wondering if you had any role plays or case studies um, with like associated questions for outbreak investigations where students could simulate an outbreak investigation. Hi, Jamie. I wanted to point out that at the end of every chapter, now in Epi 101, um, we brought in something called the YES epidemiology exercises, and those are available on the web, and the website is given 
at the end of the chapter. When I tried to go get those, they said that they were no longer hosted at that website. Yeah, that's correct. But then um, now I gave the more recent website, and uh, those are available on that website. So they okay. have um, they do have some exercises on infectious disease outbreaks in there. And um, if you would like to send me an email, I can try to provide you with some more examples of exercises as well. I'd really appreciate that. Thank you. Be happy to do that. And Jamie, I'd be happy to connect you with Dr. Freese after the session we, uh, via email. Thank you very much. Thank Welcome. You. There are no further questions at this time. Okay, great. Well, then moving right along, we've got a lot more questions here in the Q&A. Bob, would you suggest any special documentaries that we could show to students? Well, there's a million of them. Yes, a million are out there. And um, I could maybe provide some information a little bit more about that later. But there is an just one example, unnatural causes that um, deals with health disparities. That's an important one. Um, many documentaries are available from uh, the public from public um, public broadcasting networks. Uh, just many. There's a gazillion out there. Um, some on um, YouTube. So I think. Um, that could also be a good source, although I prefer, I tend not to use lectures about epidemiology from YouTube, but I know that there are many available documentary type um, videos that are available. Hey, great. Thank you, Bob. Here's another question. Do you discuss bias and or measures of association, relative risk, yeah. odds ratio, prevalence ratio, et cetera, in your book? Yes, definitely. Um, so let me just I'll give you some examples here. Let's do that. Well, all right, so for exa an example, in uh, the new chapter two, there is um, epidemiology and data presentation. And then I have information about uh, bivariate associations, Pearson correlation coefficient, um, use of scatter plots. Uh, dose response curves, contingency tables, parameter estimation. And then in the chapter on study design, I do have measures of relative risk, et cetera, association and causality. Um, let me give you some more examples. Well, ecologic studies, ecologic correlation. Um, case control studies, calculation of odds ratios, cohort studies, calculation, measures of association used in cohort studies relative risk, um, difference in rates or risks. So quite a bit on that, yes. Great, thank you. Um, here's another question. Uh, I am in the process of designing our midterm exam for our 100% online non-EPI majors graduate students. What advice do you give in terms of keeping the exam timed versus open book for a week and also using a test bank with the book, such as multiple choice questions, true-false questions, or short answer questions? Well, I, what I would do is go to the, we have a test bank that's coordinated with the textbook, and I would select questions from there that uh, measure the different content areas. Um, and then, well, as I mentioned to the another uh, question that I had, I like to have, I prefer, my preference is for a timed exam rather than an open-ended exam. But I think it depends on the context that you're working in and the types of students you have. Some, as I mentioned earlier, graduate students tend to prefer writing um, essay-type responses and um, then, um, Undergraduates perhaps would be would like to work with um, true false or multiple choice questions. Actually, true false, you know, they could seem to be simple, but they can be complicated. 
And then in my own uh, personal studies with different modes of instruction, I find that um, the kinds of, um, there's a very high correlation between uh, taking a multiple choice exam and an essay exam. Um, it's probably 0 .999 uh, correlation between the two, but then students often feel that um, they have a better chance when they're doing an essay type exam. Very good, thank you. Um, so let's see, the next question we have here is that uh, you mentioned early in the presentation using historical epidemiologic literature to present epidemiology in a liberal arts setting. Are there yeah. particular examples, and then this person wants to know if you have particular examples of literature or even film that you have found particularly effective? Well, okay, um, number one, John Snow. And um, you can actually find his, his book is available, Snow on Cholera. So that would be one of the most important ones. Um, and then um, what did Hippocrates say? He has written some um, noteworthy work on epidemiology, for example, airs, waters, and places. And then there are, are well, numerous other books um, that are available. Um, well, John Grant, Natural and Political Observations mentioned um, in a following index made upon the bills of mortality. Uh, Percival Pott on um, cancer among, scotal cancer actually among chimney sweeps. So there are many books, works of this type and then it's kind of interesting to read um, read their writings. They're, many of them are very eloquent um, authors and then some of the old fashioned terminology that they use that's very interesting. How is it relevant to today? But a lot of stuff out there, the plague, uh, Camus plague and so forth. Many, many, many things are available. Great, thank you, Bob. Uh, here's someone asking about um, a hybrid class. Um, she has a hybrid class, uh, both online and in class. Would you recommend certain chapters that need to be in person versus online? Yes. Um, all right, so what would be important to do in person? Well, I think the statistical kinds of chapters, quantitative chapters uh, would be important. So chapter two having to do with um, data and a topic there is data and measurement scales. Um, how do you do graphical presentations of data? And then me statistical measures, I think that would be probably better done in a face-to-face -face lecture, that particular topic. And then also study designs because you um, need to go over that, kind of review it. So you might talk about a case control study and then uh, students could be totally confused by what's going on. Then when you start talking about a ecologic study or a cohort study. So I find that when I work with my students, it's important to drill over and over again and then talk about the distinguishing features of an ecologic study. How is that um, interesting as a study of groups of groups rather than the individual as the unit of measurement and so forth. So I think those two areas would be important. And then also applying uh, measures of screening, sensitivity, specificity, and so forth, predictive value, positive and negative. Um, and many of the others could be done purely online. Okay. Great, thank you. Uh, here's a softball question for you, and I promise I didn't plant this one, uh, but which textbook <laughs> would you recommend <laughs> for beginning students who are learning epidemiology for the first time? Well, I I know that there are many good ones out there, so a lot of good textbooks have been written. I find that, um, well, Epidemiology 101, I'm biased, okay, I have to admit it. 
but um, I think that would be helpful for students who have um, little prior background in health and epidemiology and they want a concise overview of what's uh, going on. And then uh, maybe from this particular book, then they might um, graduate to a more complex textbook. So uh, I can just tell you my own personal experience. I've had students, one of the jobs of um, an instructor in any field, in let's say for me particularly in epidemiology, I'm trying to interest students in the study of epidemiology, possibly the professional study or becoming epidemiologists. And then they started with me in a, um, taking an, using an elementary textbook. And then many of the students went on to um, pursue further education in epidemiology. And then some of them are even professors now who actually are using Epi 101. So I wanted to share that. So that would be um, my point of view, but um, I'm biased. And I should point out there are a lot of good books out there. Thank you, Bob, uh, for your answer. And I, I can say from um, the perspective of the publisher, this is a very, one of our most popular books in public health. And uh, so I can tell you that we've, we've had feedback from our customers, our instructors, that they really, really love this book. Uh, let's see, here's- I just, can I just put in one more uh, comment? What I would like to see, I think that epidemiology could also be taught more at the um, high school level and this book could be adapt adaptable to high advanced high school students. And um, so I just wanted to mention that as well. Great, thank you. And I should also add for the second edition, we've made it full color, um, which right there, that's something that's gonna make uh, younger students more engaged. And um, there's many more uh, charts, tables, and figures, about 25% more. Uh, okay, here's another question for you, Bob. Have you used the game Pandemic? And if so, do you find it too difficult in an introductory class? Um, no, I have not personally used that um, game. Um, so um, I feel that I wouldn't be able to comment and answer that question. Okay. Um, do you go into topics such as confounding, interaction, and bias? Yes, so now I'm looking at chapter seven, and I have a section called Challenges to the Validity of Study Design, so bias in epidemiologic studies, and examples, um, Hawthorne effect, recall bias, uh, confounding, uh, selection bias, healthy worker effect, so those are discussed. Great. Thank you, Bob. And actually, before I go on to any more questions, I just want to check in with Tasha to see if anyone else is on the line for a question. There are no questions at this time. Okay. Uh, Bob, what kinds of specific resources do you use to supplement the text? Videos, simulations, for example? Well, the videos, yes, a, a lot. Um, so I have, I mentioned the um, natural causes. But then, you know what I'm, I'm actually finding is that um, there is so much material, you know, basic material that it's hard to um, introduce supplementary material. So what I like to do um, when I'm teaching epidemiology, I, I begin with a kind of a quiz um, at the beginning, like a five-point quiz, and then I answer the questions throughout the lecture. And then this is a way to encourage students to prepare um, to read in advance of attending the class. And then the other thing that I developed, um, I think that epidemiologists think in a very unique way that um, probably in other courses, um, students have never encountered this mode of thinking, and that's descriptive epidemiology. So I have been working with small teams of students, groups of four students, and as kind of a capstone exercise in class, I have them do something called a descriptive epidemiologic exercise where I recommend topics or the students select their own topic 
And then I have them develop a PowerPoint presentation that uh, runs about 20 minutes. And then um, they present information on a disease. So that's, that's a way that um, other students can learn, can expand their knowledge. And then it also gives the students who are presenting kind of job-related experience. So they actually come dressed up like as if they were going to work, and then they give their presentation, and then the other students in the class rate their presentation, give them feedback on it. And I find that that's one of the most interesting exercises and activities, supplemental activities for the students. Um, sometimes I might insert um, little videos on, very short videos on topics, or I might see something in the um, newspaper that day about, like, for example, a plant is um, polluting the community with lead, and then I'll have the students, we'll discuss that together and what are the implications for epidemiology, how could we study about that. So those are the main kinds of resources that I use, but I find that uh, there's so much material that it's difficult to um, go beyond that in the class, go beyond the material in the prescribed material in the textbook. Great, thank you. Well, we're coming up on the hour. I do have five or six more questions here, and I, I would like to try to get it to as many as possible. Um, first, I'll just answer someone is asking about uh, getting a copy of the book and accessing the instructor materials, and absolutely, um, if you want to go to the URL that's uh, here on screen, uh, go.jblearning.com slash freeze 101, you can, um, you can take any of those actions, whether you want to request um, a complimentary instructor's copy um, or request access to instructor materials, you can do that. You can also just email me um, and I can connect you um, with the right person. And I've also got some feedback, um, some commentary about the pandemic game. Um, uh, so someone saying that he's used the game for about four years and it's a great opportunity to promote collaboration uh, like what is a typical practice in, in public health. Um, rather than secretive competitive actions, which I'm not sure what that means, but I'm sure um, to others that's, that's meaningful. So thank you for that, um, that commentary. Thank you. Um, okay, a few more questions here. Um, is your book aligned, and I'm actually going to combine two questions here, is your book aligned to the ASPPH competencies for undergraduate level? Is it easy to understand what content is aligned to which competencies? And then separately, there's a question, um, can your book be used for the master's level or is it too simplistic? All right, well, um, this book flowed from the uh, 2006 Consensus Conference on Undergraduate Public Health Education, the Curriculum for Epidemiology 101. So it's aligned with the, that particular conference. And um, so that's one question here. And then what was, tell me the second question. Can you please repeat uh, that again? Sorry, yes, master's level, whether the book. Oh yes, okay, so what I recommend um, would be, yes, it could be for non-majors, epidemiology non-majors. So for example, nursing students or uh, students in healthcare administration programs. Great, thank you. Um, how does Epidemiology 101 compare to your other book, um, Epidemiology for Public Health Practice, and do they have different target audiences? Yes, they do. I'd say that um, Epidemiology 101, the public health practice goes into more details, more in-depth. There are 16 chapters versus um, 12 chapters, and then it goes into much more depth than um, each, with respect to each topic more examples, um, more statistical information. So it's on a somewhat higher level, but it's also not as concise. So Epidemiology 101 might be appropriate for someone who's looking for a concise approach to epidemiology. Great, okay, thank you. Um, do you have any data sets that would go with the book? Well, you know, there's, I personally don't have any data sets, but I use them all the time. So the um, 
National Institutes of Health, there are a lot of data sets available there, or government data sets. Um, also, um, I'm familiar with the California Health Interview Survey. They have online data sets where you can just go online. It's called Ask Chiz, and you can do analyses uh, by using that data sets. But I personally don't have any available. Now, that sounds like a good idea, though, something we could consider. Okay. What kind of group projects work well for undergrads? Well, I mentioned the idea about the epidemiologic descriptive exercise where I have a group of four students. They work in four student teams, and um, they develop a description of a quantitative description of a disease using resources such as the PubMed or Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report or American Journal of Public Health. So they combine, compile information. Let's say gonorrhea as an example. Um, what are the variations by person, time, and place? And they develop uh, PowerPoint slides and then present those to the class. Sometimes I will take questions from my the study questions and exercise section of my book, and I have the students work on those questions as kind of a group effort, or I will have teams of two students uh, rotate around different two student uh, dyads and then have them answer the questions in class, provide work on them, and then discuss them in class. So those are some examples. Okay. Great. Um, I think I may have um, gotten to everyone's questions here. I'm just doing one last um, check, and I think we, we have covered everyone's questions. Um, I would just add uh, again that uh, if you would like to request a complimentary review copy of Epidemiology 101 Second Edition, you can go to http go.jblearning.com slash freeze 101. Uh, to do that. And um, I should also add that, um, as, uh, as Bob mentioned, there are two new chapters in Epidemiology 101 Second Edition, um, one covering epidemiology and data present presentation, and, and that includes some practice, practice questions for the MCAT, uh, and then a, a second new chapter on epidemiology and screening for disease. Um, also, uh, as I mentioned, it's now in full color, 25% more tables, charts, and figures. Um, and it includes many of the examples that uh, Bob talked about today, um, very current, tangible examples uh, from the field that are going to be relevant and familiar to young students, such as big data, cyberbullying, um, and uh, disease outbreaks such as Ebola and Zika. And then finally, I would add that uh, this edition includes Navigate to Advantage Access, um, which your students can use for independent study if they'd like. There's a, the, the entire ebook uh, is included with that access. It's an access code card that they get just inside the front cover of the book. They can redeem it um, and get access to all those materials, the ebook, the end of chapter questions. Um, you can also, if you want to make that an interactive course, uh, you can request from us a course ID, um, and then you get a full student roster, grade book, et cetera. Uh, that's another option for you as well. If I've answered everyone's questions, we'll go ahead and wrap things up. Bob, thank you so much for your presentation. That was fantastic. Thank you. And also, I want to thank the attendees for tuning in today. I uh, really appreciate that. And it was fun. I enjoyed doing the webinar. Great, thank you. Yes, thank you to everyone for joining us today. As I mentioned at the start, we've recorded this entire session and I will have it posted on our new um, Public Health Faculty Lounge page on LinkedIn, which uh, you're invited to join if you would like, simply follow this link. So thank you everyone for joining and uh, Tasha, with that, let's go ahead and close out the session.